Have you ever heard of the phrase, there is no such thing as a free lunch? Right? You've heard that before. There is no such thing as a free lunch. It's a, that old adage that says it's nearly impossible to get something for nothing. So while there may not be such a thing as a free lunch, perhaps the closest thing to it is a buffet. I've shared with you before that when I was growing up, my family didn't have much at all. Simply put, we were poor. So you have to understand that when we went out to a restaurant, it was a big deal. And on this one certain occasion, my mom and dad wanted to surprise me and my sisters by taking us to the Kahiki restaurant for their all-you-can-eat buffet lunch special. And when we got there, and we went inside, and my parents met the greeter, we found out that the buffet actually closes in 20 minutes. And the greeter said, are you sure you, you want the buffet? Are you sure? We may never have a chance to come here again. Yes, we want the buffet. And so my parents turned to me and my sisters and huddled us up like it was uh, in a huddle before a big game. And they said, kids, there's not much time left in the buffet. So you need to go and get as much food on your plates as possible. And then we'll just come back and we'll eat it family style. So like being told to charge up a hill and secure that hill in a time of battle, off we went with one mission in mind to get as much food as possible. And there we were, mounds of fried, uh, of fried rice, mounds of sweet and sour chicken, mounds of pepper steak, and as we got back and sat down at the booth, my mom was the last to join us. And she said, as she set down her plate, she said, you guys just go ahead and pray and start eating. I'll be right back. And in no time, she came back carrying a whole cheesecake. Not a slice. No, not a slice, a whole cheesecake. And not just the cheesecake, but the serving platter and stand, the, the centerpiece that it was on. And she just came walking back and sat it down in the middle of all of us. And then she said, I am so embarrassed. There was this guy that was coming up to get dessert, and I just jumped in front of him and grabbed the whole cheesecake and brought it back here because the buffet was running out. I tell you, that was a delicious cheesecake. <laughs> you know, a true buffet, an all-you-can-eat smorgasbord, and that's northern talk for a whole lot of food, it kind of reminds me what we've been talking about in this sermon series on generosity. A true buffet of all you can eat where there is no shortage of sustenance. It reminds me of Pastor Dan's message on the widow and her son as they shared their meager, their meager amount of oil and flour with Elijah as God miraculously multiplied it and it never ran out. Or Pastor Randy's message last week when the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 took place as God multiplied five barley loaves and two fish from a little boy's lunch to feed a multitude of people. And when I think about a never-ending source of sustenance, I think about God's grace. And in order to understand God's grace, we need to go way back to the beginning. There in the beginning, God created everything. And God specially and uniquely created man and woman and told them to be fruitful and multiply. And God gave them all that they needed in the garden. And everything was good and right and perfect. But then the fall 
of man happened. Sin entered the world, and man and woman fell into temptation. They ate the forbidden fruit. They ignored God's command. They listened to Satan instead of listening to God. They wanted to have only the knowledge that God possessed. Essentially, man and woman wanted to be on equal footing with God. And when the fall happened, everything that was good and right and perfect changed. The first part of Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. We now have an inherited, corrupted, sinful condition from the fall. And because of this corruption that we have, it's like a disease. It's like an addiction. We are addicted to sin. We crave it. And because of our sinful corruption and the sins that we commit, we deserve death. For the wages of sin is death. But Romans 6.23 doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just say that the wages of sin is death. But the entirety of that verse says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. On this celebration of the Reformation, Martin Luther was moved by this very topic. His seminary and theological training focused only on the wages of sin is death. There was no free gift that followed for him until his eyes were opened through the gospel. Reading Galatians and Romans, Martin Luther came to understand the importance and the significance of the free gift of God that is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the eternal life that God freely gives to us. That is the message and the legacy and the spirit of the Reformation. It's all about God's generous and gracious response to us sinners. You see, from the beginning, when man and woman fell into sin, God could have just wiped them out, but he didn't. Instead, he put his grace into action from the very beginning. That's the message of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. Sure, God could have wiped them out. He didn't. God could have also just snapped his fingers and restarted it all over again. He didn't. God could have just zapped fallen man and fallen woman with a new righteousness and a new restored relationship with him, making that relationship and right all over again. He didn't. He could do whatever he wanted to do because he's God. But what he chose to do, what he chose to do was to send his son into our broken and fallen world to reclaim and redeem and restore fallen man and fallen woman and you and me. Max Lucado wrote in his book, And the the Angels Were Silent, he says this, Jesus died on purpose. No surprise, no hesitation, no faltering. The way Jesus marched to his death leaves no doubt. He had come to earth for this moment. The journey to the cross didn't begin in Jericho. It didn't begin in Galilee. It didn't begin in Nazareth. It didn't even begin in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before as the echo of the crunching of the fruit was still sounding in the garden, Jesus was leaving for Calvary. Wow. As you think about that, that the plan for our salvation was put into place from the very beginning, here is something to consider. Look with me 
at Genesis chapter 3. It's the saddest chapter in all of the Bible because it reveals the fall of man. And yet, it is also the first time that the promise of the rescue from sin is announced. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 through 13 says this, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I would contend to you that this is Jesus the pre-incarnate Christ, before being born of the Virgin Mary, the very Son of God coming to begin the plan of salvation for fallen man and fallen woman and for you and for me, it is Jesus who is walking in the garden next to Adam and Eve. How is this the pre-incarnate Jesus, God the Son, putting on flesh and walking alongside Adam and Eve in the garden? Because he's God. He is God the Son. And we're told in Scripture that no one has seen God the Father. Jesus said himself in John 6, 46, Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. So I would contend to you this morning that it is God the Son, the one who is sent by the Father, the pre-incarnate Jesus, that is walking alongside Adam and Eve, and the garden. And it is the pre-incarnate Jesus that says to the serpent, that says to Satan just what is going to happen. The Lord God, the pre-incarnate Jesus says in Genesis 3, 14, he says this to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you should go and on dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It is the pre-incarnate Jesus that says to Satan, You're going to bruise my heel. You're going to send me to the cross, but I'm going to crush your head. I'm going to defeat you. I'm going to defeat sin. I'm going to defeat death. It's Jesus calling out his shot. You see, this is grace and action from the very beginning. This is God's riches at Christ's expense. The riches of God, God's grace, the forgiveness of sins, being right with God, having life and salvation. All of this is something that is freely given to us. God's grace is freely given to us. Absolutely, God's grace is free for us but it costs Jesus everything. God's grace comes to us free, but it is, but it is at Christ's expense. It is rather mind-blowing how much God shows His lavish love for us and freely gives to us His riches because we don't deserve anything but His punishment. But God, in his love for us, in his love for you and for me, sent his son. And here is this Jesus. I mean, he's acting like he's running everything. He's working on the Sabbath and he's healing the sick and he's touching lepers. 
He's raising the dead. He's saying your sins are forgiven. And those are only things that God can do. Well, yes, because he is God. God came down to where man is at and he came to rescue man and they killed him. And even though they killed him, he delivers God's grace. The Father loved us so much that he sent his Son. Jesus loved us so much that he generously gave his life for us. The generous life of Jesus is God's grace for you and for me. This is grace. When Jesus was determined to go to the cross, Luke 9.51 tells us about grace. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Nothing was going to stop Jesus from fulfilling his mission of rescuing us. This is grace. When Jesus told his disciples in the upper room on the night when he instituted the Lord's Supper that he was going to die for them. John 15, 13 tells us about grace. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. This was not something Jesus was telling the disciples they should do. No, here on that Passover celebration, instead of recounting the rescue of their forefathers from Egypt, Jesus was preparing his disciples for another rescue, the rescue from sin. Jesus was telling them about how much he loved them and his promise to prove it with the most important act of generosity in history. This is grace. When Jesus is on the cross and he prays to God the Father for our forgiveness, Luke 23, 34 tells us about grace. As Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Romans 5, 8 explains this generous act of grace by declaring, but God shows his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is grace. When Jesus, after having defeated sin, death, and the devil on the cross, and after risen from the dead, and he forgives and restores Peter after Peter had denied him. John 21, 17 tells us about grace. As Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And like Peter, Jesus' generosity forgives us and restores us. This is grace. When we are saved and rescued now from eternal death. It is not just upon eternal life that we are rescued, but we are rescued now. Psalm 40 verse 2 tells us about grace. He drew me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. This is grace. When Jesus speaks his truth to you and to me about why he came down to us and what his generous life gives to us, as Jesus declares in John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. My friends, he speaks that truth to us even now. Jesus came that you may have life and have life abundantly. We live in a grace-filled life and an abundant life in grace right now because of the generous life of Jesus. You see, we are the recipients of the greatest charitable act in history. In Christ alone, we have all that we will ever need 
freedom from the bondage of sin, a restored and right relationship with God our Father, an abundant life in the here and now in Christ, and an imperishable inheritance of eternal life that awaits us in the love of the one who poured himself out and laid down his life for us, his friends. This extraordinary act is not only the foundation of our salvation, it's the foundation of our generosity too. We love because he first loved us. We give because we know what it is like to never be able to have met that need ourselves. We live a new kind of life, a full life of hope that we share with others. And we hope for the day that is promised to us, the return of our generous Savior, Jesus. Our generosity is a response to God's generosity. Not in a manner of earning his favor, but in response to God graciously and generously giving to us his favor. Today, we will have the opportunity to respond to God's grace with our financial commitments for the 2024 calendar year. This is us living out the generosity of giving. This is us taking the next step on the generosity ladder. On, on the back of those pledge cards, it talks about that generosity ladder of becoming a first-time giver, giving on a regular basis, growing toward an attitude of a 10% tithe, and tithing and an extravagant generosity. This is the next step. And as you listen about that next step, listen to these, the words of 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. These pledge cards are available in the pew backs in front of you. And, or there's a simple way of uh, giving through the QR code sticker on the pews. And when you click on the pledge button. And during the offering, you can bring your offering and pledge card forward. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that is what the grace is of giving is all about. Invite our band and our communion assistants to come forward. You see, unlike cheesecake at a closing buffet, God's lavish love for us never runs out. So does that mean that we should go on sinning so that grace would abound? Absolutely not. That would cheapen grace. You see, cheap grace is the grace we try to give ourselves without living abundantly in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran pastor in Germany during World War II who opposed Adolf Hitler, once said, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. No, we don't live an abundant life of cheap grace. You see, we come to the altar confessing our sinfulness because God's grace is costly. We come to the altar to be fed His grace. And here at this meal, there's no such thing as a free lunch either. Oh, it's free for you and me indeed. 
but it cost Christ everything. It's an expensive meal because it cost Christ his life so that we would have life. We come to the altar to receive the forgiveness of sins and life and salvation, which is only possible because of the generous life of Jesus.